This program is about unsolved mysteries. Whenever possible, the actual family members and police officials have participated in recreating the events. What you are about to see is not a news broadcast. It began as a weekend of fun and sun at a seaside Mexican resort. But after a heated argument with his girlfriend, Mario Amato found himself arrested for disorderly conduct and tossed into jail. Less than 90 minutes later, Mario was dead under the most suspicious of circumstances. September 1978, Catoosa, Oklahoma. Chief J.B. Hamby jumps into the middle of a robbery attempt and a shootout erupts. Moments later, Hamby dies as he recites the Lord's Prayer. Perhaps you can help catch his killer. A decade ago, the Texas oil boom made Ed Baker a millionaire. But in 1988, Baker's burned out car was found in a remote rice field, and police said the body inside was Ed Baker's. Some believe it was suicide, but others are convinced it was murder. Join me tonight. You may be able to help solve a mystery. In Oklahoma, automobile license plates are distributed through privately owned franchises called tag agencies. These businesses keep little cash on hand. Nevertheless, they have become tantalizing targets for thieves who traffic in stolen cars. Just after 8 a.m. on September 1st, 1978, two men pulled up in front of the tag agency in Catoosa, Oklahoma, a suburb of Tulsa. This a robbery? Get down on the ground, lady. Don't look at me. Come on! We're being robbed. Call the police. Come on! Move! Keep your head down! Don't look at me, lady. Do not look at me, lady. Don't hurt us. Please. Shut up. Don't look at me. Chief, there's a robbery in progress at the Catoosa Tag Agency. At least one employee inside. Out. The only police officer in Catoosa was Chief J.B. Hamby, a 24-year veteran in law enforcement whose devotion to duty was well known. J.B. was on call, all hours, no sleep. Come in, shower, change clothes, right back out. For those people that was on the wrong side of the law, he could become probably their worst nightmare. He was relentless. rounds ricocheted through the small store in a matter of seconds. One robber was killed, the other was hit twice, but somehow managed to escape. Miraculously, neither of the women in the tag agency had been hurt. Chief Hamby was not so lucky. He staggered from the agency, bleeding profusely. JB attempted to reload his gun. And at that point, he probably sensed that he was, you know, gravely injured. And uh, from there, went right on into the laundry to get him help. He needed help. JB. JB. Uh, it's all right. Call the ambulance. JB, it's OK. It's all right. The ambulance is coming. Repeat after me, JB. Stay with me. Uh, Our Father, our Father, who art in heaven, heaven. hallowed be thy name. I'll be thy Thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come. J.B. Hamby died before he had finished reciting the Lord's Prayer. 
One of the robbers was dead at the scene, shot through the head by his own ricocheting bullet. The second robber was apprehended two hours later while being treated for gunshot wounds at a nearby hospital. He was 25-year-old David Gordon Smith, the son of a prominent couple from Stillwater, Oklahoma. At first, Smith thought he was being arrested only for armed robbery. Instead, David Gordon Smith was booked on charges of first-degree murder. On June 15, 1979, Smith began serving a life sentence in the Oklahoma prison system. Ballistics tests had proved that the bullet which killed Chief Hamby had been fired from Smith's gun. Open 43! It was so conclusive, I mean, beyond a shadow of a doubt. They had every bullet accounted for. They knew, they knew whose gun it come from. They knew where that person was at because of the line and trajectory. They had everybody placed in that office and who had what gun. David Gordon Smith was a classic good boy gone bad, the son of a respected university professor. This had been his first and only brush with the law, and he set out to become a model prisoner. Smith was uh, a good prisoner. He was well-liked by the staff that had to deal with him. He was also uh, well-liked by the other inmates. And as he served his time and as his years grew and his behavior was excellent, he was, uh, according to Oklahoma law, classified uh, to a trustee status. And uh, his job at the time was to monitor equipment at our lake. Smith was assigned to live and work all alone at a small water pumping station. He was checked every hour by a prison guard. On three separate occasions, Smith was granted unsupervised furloughs for doctor's appointments. And on June 26, 1982, with the permission of prison authorities, he got married. I don't think there's any way, by any stretch of the imagination, that he deserved any sort of lenient treatment. I, I think it's unheard of. You know, I think he should have got the death penalty. I think he should have got maximum, you know, hard time. Uh, I could have lived with that. David Gordon Smith, you're serving a life sentence for murder of a police officer. In 1984, a full 10 years ahead of schedule, David Gordon Smith was granted a parole hearing. What have you done while in prison to make yourself fit for society once again? I've got a job since I've been in prison with a clean conduct record. I've married. And should I be paroled, my wife would be a support for me. I've been going to church, and I have a strong faith in God. I begin to think how he would attempt to sell somebody that, you know, he was Joe Clean Citizen, you know. I think he seen that there was such an outcry from the public and, and friends and law enforcement uh, that he was fighting an uphill battle. I have recorded four nay votes in the parole recommendation of uh, David Gordon Smith. Smith failed in his parole attempt. However, he retained trustee status and continued his job at the lake. Next inmate, please. For more than a year, Smith remained a model prisoner. But then on October 28, 1985, a prison guard stopped for his regular 1 a.m. check of Smith's sleeping quarters. The model prisoner, David Gordon Smith, had made a clean getaway. He uh, probably walked from the room at the lake out to the nearest highway a mile or so away where Joe Beth, his wife, picked him up. They went into McAllister, which is a mile or so from the prison, and mailed two letters. We know that. Authorities learned that one week before the escape, Smith's wife had closed out her bank account, sold her furniture, and borrowed $1,000 from friends. She told a travel agent she was going to Mexico. She never mentioned her husband. Then four months later, in February of 1986, David Gordon Smith was sighted with a female companion in Arkansas, just 90 miles from the prison where he had been incarcerated. The authorities were notified but by the time they arrived, Smith had vanished. I believe that, that David Gordon Smith is still dangerous today. 
he will do whatever is necessary to try to escape again if confronted by by either law enforcement or by a private citizen that's why i would i would recommend that no private citizen try to apprehend him because i believe that he probably is armed i want to see david gordon smith serve his time I just think it's one of the most unjust things that could ever happen. And JB uh, lived his job as a police officer 24 hours a day. A very intense person that took his job extremely serious. For a man that stood up for so many things for so many people on the right side of the law. That loss can never be filled and I, I just don't think it's fair. When we first aired this story last October, we received more than 75 leads, but none of them panned out. However, one thing we have learned on Unsolved Mysteries over the years is never to give up. The story aired again in March, and this time in a small South Dakota town, the right viewer was watching. He called the local authorities, and they immediately contacted the FBI. One day following the airing of the David Gordon Smith case on Unsolved Mysteries, an anonymous tip was received giving us his location. He was working as a service manager at an automobile dealership in Spearfish, South Dakota. Agents of the FBI, local authorities in South Dakota went to his place of employment. He was arrested without incident and he readily admitted his identity upon questioning. When David Gordon Smith is brought back to Oklahoma, he'll go immediately into our, our system. He'll be classified as a maximum security inmate. And uh, because of his uh, escape, uh, he will be in our maximum security prison for a long time. There's a tremendous amount of relief. Uh, it was equivalent to a, a long-term gigantic debt being paid off. For thousands of American tourists, the breathtaking sunsets of Mexico have always been an invitation for romance, fantasy, and adventure. In June of 1992, Joe Amado and his younger brother Mario left Los Angeles with their girlfriends. They were headed to Rosarita Beach, Mexico, a popular seaside resort 35 miles south of San Diego. But their weekend in the sun would soon disintegrate into a nightmare. The next day, Mario Amado was arrested after a fight with his girlfriend. 90 minutes later, he was dead. The local authorities claimed that Mario had committed suicide. I say it was murder, plain murder. And I knew that from the beginning because I know my brother very well. I mean, they stole his life away from him. and. Uh, we're gonna to get to the bottom of this. Mario Amato is not the first American tourist to die in a foreign jail. And his family is not the first to be haunted by the vague details of an official investigation. In such cases, facts are few and clues are hard to come by. However, Mario's brother is determined to learn exactly what happened to him during his brief captivity. As a result of Joe Amato's efforts, this potentially explosive case has sparked the interest of high-level government officials including an American congressman and the president of Mexico. The Amado brothers arrived in Rosarita Beach just after 1 a.m. on June 6, 1992. They were staying at a condo owned by a relative of Mario's girlfriend, whom we will call Paula. Joe and his girlfriend, Debbie, eagerly accepted an invitation to come along. The two couples immediately broke out the tequila. I says, well, what are we here for? To party. Let's have a good time. Everybody sat around and we started having our drinks. You know? And uh, I guess it was later on about 3.30, 4 o'clock, and I was getting kind of tired. And 
told Debbie, it's time to go to bed. About 7 o'clock, we woke up, and they were still up, and they were bickering. I want to leave now. I want to go home. She's driving me crazy. Oh, Mario. Please. Go to bed. Go to sleep, huh? I felt very disturbed because I know Mario liked this girl very much, and he wouldn't have wanted to leave if it wasn't something serious that he felt that he just didn't want to stay. Hit the bar, have a couple drinks. By late the next morning, Mario and Paula had apparently patched up their differences. That was the last time I saw him alive. Hey Mario, leave the key underneath the mat. But I can still remember that expression on his face. He he, he seemed very happy, like nothing was wrong. That afternoon, Joe and Debbie took a romantic drive along the coast of Baja, California. They assumed that Mario and Paula were getting along fine. I want you and your brother out of here. I never want to you, see you I again. I can't believe it. I'm this this is your you. idea of a fun no time way. out here? What are you talking about? You're... I can't believe this. Hey, can I have some clothes, please? I want your clothes. Yes, I want my clothes. Your clothes. Now get out. Thank you. Mario was arrested for public drunkenness and disorderly conduct and taken to the police station. Mario was placed in a holding cell, but never formally charged with a crime. At around 6.30 p.m., Joe and Debbie returned to the beach house. They were surprised to find it vacant and the key under the mat missing. Listen, there was some trouble here before. Uh, the police came. A maid from the condominium complex explained that there had been problems there a few hours earlier. The police came? Debbie crawled through a window to get inside. Almost immediately, four police officers showed up asking for Paula by name. What's wrong? What's going on? She's looking for Paula. She's, She's not there. here. Do you know what she might be? Is there something wrong? No, no. We would just like to ask her a couple of questions. Did you try the bar down the street? No, senor, we did not. The cantina, yeah? Yeah, right yes. next door. Gracias. And that's when Debbie really started getting suspicious, right about that time. She followed him down to the bar. She got in, uh, uh, put her clothes on and got ready and went right down to the bar and they were looking for her frantically. A little later, Mario's girlfriend does come just waltzing in the house and uh, <laughs> like nothing was wrong. And we asked her, where's Mario? And she said she didn't know. He's probably in some gutter somewhere. Oh, some gutter, real cute, real Paula. cute. Paula. Two hours after Paula returned, a group of detectives arrived. Joe still had no idea that his brother had been arrested. I am looking for the brother of Vicente Amador. I'm sorry, but we don't know Vicente Amador. You don't know Vicente Amador? My brother's name Mario Vicente Amado. Yes, that's him. I'm Sergeant Tinoco. I have some bad news. Your brother is dead. Sorry. What happened to my brother? Perhaps it's better if you come with us. We should talk about it in my office. The first thing that went through my mind is they what made happened? a mistake. And maybe they didn't make a mistake, but I was hoping they had made a mistake. And I was just in disbelief that this could be happening. It's like a nightmare. Hey, please sit down. I need you to identify some pictures here. Now. Is this your brother? The first thing I see is Mario laying on the concrete. His eyes closed, no shirt, just his pants. And the jail door. And then at that time, he says, well, how could this happen? I asked him. Why isn't he wearing a sweater? That's how he killed himself. 
What? He tied it around his neck, and then he tied it around the crossbar and hung. Where was this crossbar? About three feet off the ground. Three feet? It was very drunk and very heavy. Oh, come on. How do you hang yourself from three feet? So I asked him, was there anybody in the, in the jail to stop him from doing this? He says, uh, oh, no, they're all sleeping. He says, four guys sleeping at 5.30 in the afternoon? I, I was just couldn't believe that. Uh, right away, I knew there was something wrong. And I says, well, how did, he, how did he kill himself? Oh, with a sweater. And I'm going, no, oh, no, 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 uh-uh. You, you can't kill yourself with a sweater. From where? Oh, from the, from the, the cell door. And I go, no, no, right away. I mean, everything wasn't right. Mario Amato died three months short of his 30th birthday. Joe Amato was forced to return to the United States without his brother. The Mexican authorities refused to release the body until after they had completed their autopsy, and they would not tell Joe when that would happen. Within a week, the Mexican autopsy was completed. It listed the cause of death as a loss of oxygen to the brain, the result of Mario hanging himself. Joe Amato believed that was preposterous and contacted his congressman. The Mexican autopsy confirmed the report of the jailers in Tijuana that Mario Amato had hung himself with his own sweater. When you take the notion of a report from a local foreign authority that a prisoner killed himself, it always makes sense to view that kind of report with some suspicion. Uh, this is the oldest excuse for a, a, a jail murder uh, uh, that's ever given, is that the prisoner hung himself. As soon as his brother's body was returned to the United States, Joe Amato hired an independent pathologist to conduct a second autopsy. The autopsy concluded that internal injuries to Mario's liver were strong evidence that he had been punched in the upper abdomen. The report stated that in light of such injuries, quote, the victim would not likely have been able to hang himself. Mario Amato was undoubtedly and most likely hung at that time with, uh, with, with an instrument, not his sweater, but some other instrument uh, uh, to use as the uh, a pretext for uh, the obvious ab abuse and finally the murder that took place. Ultimately, the Los Angeles County Coroner reviewed both the American and Mexican autopsy reports. He determined that Mario Amado had probably been murdered. There is one other disturbing element in this case, the fact that Mexican authorities violated international agreements by not contacting the U.S. consulate as quickly as possible following Mario's death. You start to see uh, a picture of a cover-up starting to take place. The people involved in this incident uh, did not want uh, authorities coming quickly uh, to, the, to the scene of the crime, and uh, they wanted the period of time to elapse. They hoped that Joe Amato would forget about it. His brother was dead. Uh, uh, he'd go back to the United States and, and drop the whole issue. They usually do it uh, very speedy way when there is no relative or friend when a foreign uh, person dies. But when the family is there, their friends are there, I mean, they just do it uh, by letter days after, you know? Eventually, Congressman Berman contacted the president of Mexico, Carlos Salinas de Gortari. The president promised to reopen the investigation, and in January of 1993, the body of Mario Amado was exhumed for yet another autopsy. The truth is going to come out of the full investigation that we are making with the American government, that we asked them to cooperate in the reason their witnesses and the evidence were here in the States. The truth will come out. I'd like to see the, 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 the people that, that, that committed the crime suffer for it because we're suffering and somebody's got to suffer also, you know? They're just not going to go, it's not going to go away, you know? It's just something that's, that's going to be there and I'm going to ruin their lives just like they've ruined mine and our family, you know? Somebody's got to pay, you know?
When we return, the mysterious final days of a Texas oil millionaire. November 8, 1985. In a remote rice field, 20 miles outside Houston, Texas, flames ravage an expensive Jaguar sedan. Inside, sheriff's deputies found a charred human body, so disfigured that even the gender was not apparent, so completely burned that its weight was reduced to 32 pounds. The car was registered to a millionaire oil well promoter from Houston, Edward Gerald Baker, Eventually, forensic tests indicated with near certainty that the body was indeed Ed Baker's. Ed Baker personified Texas in the 1980s, powerful, bold, and rich. A one-time shoe salesman and insurance agent, he built a multi-million dollar oil investment business seemingly overnight. Then in 1985, Baker's world came to a fiery end. However, even now, the exact circumstances of his death are disputed. Some believe he took his own life. Others are certain he was murdered. Incredibly, a few people even think Ed Baker may still be alive. Ed Baker seemed an unlikely person to be at the center of such a deadly puzzle. His company, Vanguard Groups International, was one of the fastest growing businesses in the United States. I watched him build that company from the ground up and I think that he, um, he always knew he had the potential to have a very successful business. And I think he tried his best to manage that business honestly and with a great deal of integrity. Ed Baker started promoting oil well exploration in 1980. His timing was perfect. $3,500 is your upfront investment here. You also sign a promise. Houston was booming. After his first oil wells came in, Baker had no trouble selling his clever tax shelters to wealthy investors. Okay, but here's the kicker. Here's the kicker, Frank. I'm going to guarantee eight to ten wells per package. The income from those wells is going to pay off that promissory note. People tended to trust him. He was acknowledged as a you know pretty brilliant uh, strategist when it came to developing these little you know, tax shelter programs at that time. Now, the laws have changed since then, but at that time, it was brilliant. When Ed Baker founded Vanguard, his wife, Mary, was one of only three employees, and cardboard boxes served as their file cabinets. Four years later, Vanguard sales had skyrocketed to $19 million. The flood of wealth prompted drastic changes in Ed Baker's life. In March of 1984, he divorced Mary, his wife of 10 years. Soon after, he began to indulge a taste for high-stakes gambling. Baker also underwent two facelifts, took disco lessons, and purchased a flashy new Jaguar. In September of 1984, Baker remarried, only to file for divorce five months later. Just four days after the dissolution was final, he married Sandy Hoff, one of his employees at Vanguard. All the while, Baker's financial empire was disintegrating. Thank you, John. John, there is nothing to worry about at this point. I promise you there is nothing to worry about. The wells will come in. Has at the time, Ward Boosey was Ed Baker's not. personal attorney. We're not going to now. If in 85, when the oil industry hurt a lot of people in Houston, people stopped investing in deals that Ed was selling. And as it turns out, he was borrowing from a lot of his investors to sustain his lifestyle always, I believe, assuming that he was going to be able to repay the people that he borrowed from, from the next group of folks. Sooner or later, there was not a next group of folks. He was looking at some serious charges from a lot of his investors. He was looking at, turns out, serious tax problems. It may have been very uh, true that he was about to go to jail. By October of 1985, Baker's investors were clamoring for money, but Vanguard was on the edge of bankruptcy Baker allegedly arranged a desperately needed cash bailout from a highly suspect Bob, source. Ed, uh, we need to talk. I, I, not on the phone, OK? We, then we, he we brought in his it. private investigator. I got the impression from Ed he's talking big money, such as millions. Let me get back with you, OK? 
and he thought maybe we'd have to do a little background on these individuals that uh, he was preparing to uh, have some financial dealings with in, in Florida because he'd heard that they or yes, he'd, he had heard that they had some sort of mafia connections. What took you so long? I took the back roads. Are you all right? Ed Baker seemed unable to reverse his downward spiral. On November 6th, at around 7.30 p.m., he showed up at his ex-wife Mary's house in a state of emotional disarray. Sit down, I'll get you a cup of coffee. I was really kind of shocked because he was real pale, and he was afraid he was being followed. And this was very unusual, you know, for him to behave this way, and was just, it didn't fit what I normally knew. Now tell me what this is all about. I really didn't want to get you involved with this, Mary. He told me that he had received death threat letters at work within the past two weeks. And that that day he had received two telephone calls at his unlisted home number telling him, this is your day to die. Who was it? I don't know. He was taking it seriously that you know, he was really threatened at that point. Why don't you call the police? I can't do that, Mary. The police won't do anything until something happens. Well, don't go home. We're in a hotel room. Stay with me. I can't do that, Mary. I have to be home tonight to take a call from Sandy. She'd be worried if I wasn't there. And he got in his car and drove away. And that was the last time I saw him. According to Sandy, her husband had sent her to Austin out of range of the threats. Sandy says she spoke to Baker around 1 a.m. He was holed up in their bedroom and told her he had received yet another life-threatening call. Hello? Baker, it's time to die. Who is this? Who is this? Two days later, on November 8th, sheriffs were notified of the burned-out Jaguar. In the passenger seat were the charred remains later identified as Ed Baker's. From the evidence on the scene, it appeared that the subject in the car had been shot. There was a burnt 32 caliber revolver in the right front floorboard, which would have been at the passenger's feet. When we opened and examined the 32 pistol, the cartridge underneath the firing pin had an indentation in it, like it had been fired. The other five shells looked like they had been exploded by heat. Somebody obviously was trying to burn the car. Uh, it appeared at the time that it was a rather crude effort. I mean, we found three gallon cans of gasoline inside that vehicle and around that vehicle, more than enough to sufficiently burn it up. As they were leaving the scene, investigators made another troubling discovery. About 1,500 feet from the car was a second body a young man in his early 20s had been handcuffed and beaten to death, apparently just hours earlier. We thought to start with it might have been a person that killed Mr. Baker and somebody killed him and shut him up. Our final determination, we found out it wasn't connected. We found out the boy that we found, the second body we found was killed in a dope deal and just was dumped in that area. It happened to be a dumping area. That same day, the case took another surprising twist. A letter from Baker arrived at the office of his attorney, Ward Boosie. It said, uh, Dear Ward, if you are reading this letter, it means that I am dead. I've had some threats on my life. You've been a good friend to me. Please take care of Sandy and the kids and do what you can for them. And enclosed is another letter that I would like you to take out to Sandy and give to her for me. In the weeks that followed, the fate of Ed Baker became the subject of intense speculation. His wife, Sandy, who today lives in Europe, was convinced that he was the victim of a mafia hit. An eyewitness told police that he saw a blue Chevy pickup truck with chrome rails and mag wheels speeding away from the field where Baker's car was found. The truck and whoever was in it have never been located. Although Baker told a number of friends about the threats to his life, Law enforcement investigators believe he committed suicide.
They learned that in the days prior to his death, Baker called his life insurance agents. He specifically asked if his policies would pay in the event of his suicide. One, valued at $500,000, would not. I believe it's a possibility that Mr. Baker shot himself, committed suicide, and that he had an accomplice that set the car on fire to make it look like a homicide so that all of the insurance policies would pay off. We'll have a lot of people we find in a car commit suicide with pistols, and the pistol is always at their feet, and the pistol we recovered would have been at Mr. Baker's feet on the passenger side of the vehicle. Sandy Baker refused to accept the idea that her husband had taken his own life. She hired an independent private investigator. I think somebody was paid to kill Ed Baker. Uh, if you're relating to professional like a mafia or a syndication type thing, I don't think so. I don't know why they would burn the car. This seems to be just somebody was paid to kill Ed Baker, and that's exactly what they did. Uh, Ed Baker did not commit suicide. Baker's attorney, Ward Boosie, disagrees. The letter I got said, if you're reading this, I am dead. How did he know he was going to die that night, unless he planned on going out and killing himself? I think Ed decided that he was about to probably go to jail and decided to get Sandy out of town so that she wouldn't be implicated, said goodbye to everybody that he loved, went out to this field that he knew about, set his car on fire, and shot himself. From what I know about uh, fire, and I spent over 20 years in the business, I don't believe an individual can pour gasoline on themselves, ignite it, and be able to stay calm and still enough to reach down and put a gun to their head and pull the trigger. Homicide is a possibility, but also I feel the possibility that Ed could arrange something like this with a different body in that vehicle. Ed was a very intelligent man, a man that took in, uh, as he told me himself, $66 million the last year that he was in business. And uh, a man capable of doing that is capable of faking his own death. Bob Gale and others believe that despite conclusive evidence to the contrary, Ed Baker faked his own suicide. They are convinced that Baker fled to an unknown location, perhaps the Caribbean, to live in luxury on funds embezzled from his investors. Today, the fate of Ed Baker has become something of a myth in parts of Texas. It seems unlikely that Baker is still alive, yet one of his insurance carriers refused to pay death benefits without conclusive proof that he is dead. But if it was Ed Baker in the front seat of the Jaguar, did he commit suicide or was he murdered? And if so, by whom? What is this? What is In 1957, 13-year-old Sue Scribner learned of a secret that her mother Callista had been carrying for more than 15 years. Yeah, honey, just a little. When I asked her why she had been crying, she told me about having a boy and a girl twin that had been adopted. It's time I told you. Told me what? I was really surprised because I was 13, and, it, and it's a shock to find out that you have a brother and sister that you didn't know about. In 1942, Callista Scribner had given birth to twins, a boy and a girl. The infants were born with congenital heart defects and Callista felt she would be unable to provide them with the care they needed. Three weeks after they were born, the twins were adopted. Callista never saw them again. The twins being adopted, it just stayed with her forever. She never got over it. For 10 frustrating years, Sue Scribner searched for the twins. Finally, in 1990, Sue wrote a poignant open letter to the brother and sister she had never met. And so elusive twins, I still search. Yet should my efforts end in emptiness, I have not failed so completely, for I have already found you once, years ago, chasmed in that deep, indelible well, that safe place, our mother's heart. Ten days after we featured this story, 
Sue Scribner received an anonymous call from one of our viewers who told her that the twins were living in Orlando, Florida. Sue immediately contacted her brother and sister, whose names are Bruce and Barbara. The twins had no idea that they had been adopted and were shocked to learn about a side of their family they never knew existed. On March 15, 1992, Sue Scribner met her brother and sister for the first time in her life. The joyous reunion brought together six of the Scribner children and their families. The very first time I met them, I think all of our knees were shaking. It is emotional, but I think we've all cried enough tears and we didn't need a lot today. I think that my newfound family is wonderful. I think they're absolutely adorable. It's like we've known each other all of our lives, even though we haven't been around each other more than five hours. <laughs> you can lose me for another 50 years. <laughs> I can't wait to get to know them. I'm really very excited about it. And, uh, you have all these questions in your mind. Gee, what did I miss out on all these years? What were they really like as kids? She used to be small. <laughs> I think everybody's going to get to know each other, both sides of the family. And uh, for the country bumpkins like we are, it's like a blessing. It doesn't really matter now what kind of life any of us had, because it's, it's what's left that counts. We know where all of the children are now. Tonight, the FBI has requested our cooperation in a matter of extreme importance. They hope that someone watching has vital information about a man suspected of taking part in the bombing of the World Trade Center. He is the newest addition to the FBI's 10 most wanted list. Please watch closely. By now, we are all familiar with the graphic images and horrifying details. On February 26, 1993, the explosion beneath New York's Trade Center complex killed six people and injured more than a thousand. Thus far, four men have been arrested and indicted in connection with the bombing, and a fifth has been charged with obstruction of justice. But another suspect, thought to be a major participant, has so far eluded capture. He is 25-year-old Ramzi Ahmed Yosef who used an Iraq passport to enter the U.S. in September of 1992, seeking political asylum. Authorities believe Yosef may have been the roommate of the first suspect arrested, Mohammed Salome. Ramzi Ahmed Yosef was added to the top 10 list because he's been charged by a New York grand jury with participating in the bombing of the World Trade Center in fe on February 26th of this year. He's six feet tall, 180 pounds, brown hair, brown eyes, sometimes known to wear a beard. Wherever he is located, he should be considered armed and extremely dangerous. It's really critical to bring him to justice for his participation in this crime for two reasons. One, the terrible nature of the crime, uh, what it represents to American society, the first major uh, terrorist offensive here in this country in many, many years. Uh, and secondly, because he is a key part of this uh, conspiracy, and we would like to bring all the co-conspirators to justice. Thank you for joining us, and please join us next time for another edition of Unsolved Mysteries. Thank you.